Perfect. Mm. Okay, so we're gonna go through chapter number five of the Handsome Machine Learning book. This chapter is for logistic regression. The first thing that we need to know is that we need to ask ourselves, why do we need to use logistic regression instead of another method or a simple linear regression? In this case, we use logistic regression kind of like a classification method. This is when we have our, our um, how do I say it? Our variable, our response variable, it is um, a one or a zero, a yes or a no. So if we try to fit a linear regression, we get this, this plot, we get this linear, we get this linear relationship that it doesn't really make sense. It doesn't really capture anything from the model. It doesn't really predict any value from the response variable very well. Instead, if we do a logistic regression, we get this plot on the right that is zeros, that is a line, a sinusoidal line, I think it is called. And it goes from zero all the way to one, where it kind of models the probability of getting that, of getting a zero or a one. Well, depending of all the other variables. Yeah. One thing that I wanted to mention here is that a logistic regression is just a type of, oh, here it doesn't show everything, but a generalized a logistic regression is just a type of a generalized linear models. And there are a lot of generalized linear models, almost for every, exponential type of family distribution, and it depends on your data. You can use a gamma regression, you can use a Poisson regression, and in this case, a logistic regression is just a generalized linear model for the binom binomial case. In here, I had like the all the equations in order to get to the function, but it's not showing everything. Let me show it here. In here, it shows, as you can see here, the last part, this is the, this is like the formula that it shows in the book. That's correct. That is the formula that it shows in the book where theta is our mean, our mean that we are trying to express. In this case, it is, well, our betas and our x's. It is just a regression equation. In order to get theta, in order to get theta to p, we need a function. Uh, in order to connect theta to p, we need a function that is called the link function of a generalized linear model. And in this case, what we can do is that we can apply a logit, logit function that is just a log here on the left, on the right, sorry, and that will connect theta to p. That, that is how we get the logistic regression, and that we that is how we get the link function for the logistic regression. That okay, let's continue here. Something that I also want to mention is that in generalized linear model in R, we get the estimations via Fisher scoring. This is an iterative method for getting estimations. It's, I 
think I'm not really sure, but I think it depends a lot on least squares. Or, but it is a Fisher scoring iterative method in order to get the estimations in R. In here, um, well, Mateo. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, oh, hi. Uh, sorry, but I, I have you know some issues with that with my speaker. Uh, that equation that you mentioned uh, in it's the not... previous, uh, yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's the normal uh, equation, okay? Uh, which is related to the matrix uh, to calculate the uh, the coefficients on the linear regression model, and also uh, is used to um, uh, you know to minimize the the least squares, okay? Okay. Uh, okay. There is um, there is a reference. I think it's a practical practical uh, da, uh, practical statistics uh, for data scientists, and it mentions that that equation. Okay, I can check the the reference. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, I this equation I know that is there is the Fisher scoring algorithm that it is used in R for getting the estimations from an iterative way. I should have like explained a little bit better what all those matrices are. Okay, but let's continue here. So in the book, it show us two models first. In the first one, we get a generalized linear model. That's how we call the function. It is very similar to just writing linear models. And we say that we wanted to do the model for attrition, depending on the monthly income. We do the family. We specify the family that is a binomial, as I was saying. And for the second model, we do the same, but depending on overtime. One thing that I see that is, it is not mentioned here, it's that the author doesn't say doesn't really say a lot about link about the link function uh, in this case glm it takes the oof, I, i'm not really sure how to say it but there is a better link a canonical a canonical link for each family of the generalized linear models if we do not specify here which link we want to use, or just go ahead and use the canonical link for the family. Uh, as I was saying before, for the binomial family, the link function is the logit function. That is just the log of exponential over one plus exponential. In this case, we get those two graphics where in the first one to the left we can say how uh, if the monthly income increases the probability of attrition decreases and if and in the second model if a worker does over time the probability of attrition increases as well So in here, well, the author was doing like a tidy. Instead, I what I'm doing a summary for the fun for the model, and it gave us a deviance. It is a type of the deviance is a type of residuals that we use for generalized linear models, and it gives us the coefficients here. In order to get like to interpret those coefficients, what we can say is that for this case, since it is negative, indicates that as we were we were seeing before, an increase in monthly income, it is associated with a decrease in the probability of attrition. And for model two, employers, here we have it, Okay, since it is positive, 
employers well who work overtime it is associated with an increased probability of attrition compares to those who doesn't work overtime uh, you can see here that it is doing the Fisher scoring it takes five iterations to get like to uh, come to the to converge I don't know if you say it like that and also we can exponential we can take these estimates and do an exponential to have a better like understanding of what they mean since a lot of times for these generalized linear models the downside is that we lose some kind of some kind of explanation it is hard to explain since we are doing some transformations on the mean function we are taking some well link functions to like map the regression equation to the mean of the generalized linear of the generalized of the exponential family that we are using we are losing some kind of explanation to this to these estimates now could you could you go back a little bit sure. yeah so because in here when we actually looking at the, these estimates this is a kind of a just kind of a low value like a like a theta theta uh in in your your odd ratio because you actually in your you in your formula you actually calculate about the odd ratio which is a phi, p is a one plus exponential theta for, and then this right so based on the this formula we can actually understand about the, what this one actually means so maybe for example in the monthly income cases it's a, like a 10 negative four in this case, right? So one, two, three, zero, zero. So that means it actually, our odd ratio, like a percentage is kind of like a one plus uh, E negative 0 0.001338. 0, uh, and then E negative, Point zero zero one eight three eight six. This is how how we can usually uh, translate about because we actually cannot translate as they as it is based on the this one. This one is actually the P is actually this formula actually stands for about the, what is called the odd ratio, which is compare like uh, based on the this kind of. Um, perspectives how when the monthly income is increases what's the probability of attrition gonna be changing from zero to one okay and then this formula actually calculates about the debt percentage debt likelihood so that means this one is actually looks like a e uh it, this one is actually like a uh like a point uh, point, uh, point, I think that uh, it's a multiplier, right? 100 means 0.1% actually. So that means whenever we have uh, the dollar increase for the monthly income, there is a 0.1% percentage actually probability increases that attrition gonna be from changing from zero to one. So that's not how we can interpret. And then uh, this one is also the same thing because uh, this one is actually positive, right, in here. So we usually act, uh, translate this one based on the also same thing for the this formula because uh, these are the actually set up. So like this. And then it is also same for the one, two, eight, nine, nine. Divide, divide by E12899. 
So based on the this one, and then we can try to try to estimate the estimate the likelihood or probability that changing that status, like our response, our binary response variable, gonna be changed from zero to one. So actually, what this model, this model estimate says is basically about the, the percentage or probability of the of the of the changing our list changing in our response variable from zero to one, depending on the changes in X, our independent variable. That's the how we can actually interpret this one. That's what I understand. So yeah, when you use the, this formula that you show in the previous slide, that allows us to uh, calculate the that prob uh, likelihood and probability. And then we can uh, maybe uh, explain this result based on the formula. Actually, it is easy to say maybe in R you can say co f, and then exponential. Uh, uh, I think at exponential. And yes. Co yeah, co f and model one in this case, like this. When you type this one, you will see the these p values. Okay, thank you. Yes, you are correct. So in this case for the binomial, for the logistic regression, that is how we will interpret those estimates. But I, I will, what I was trying to say is that in most of the generalized linear models, since we do transformations, it is very hard and we lose, lose a way to explain those estimates. But yes, in the logistic regression, we can explain them through those odds ratio. That's correct. Now for the multiple logistic regression here, it is very similar to what we were seeing with the linear model. Oh, sorry. With the linear model. In here, we create another model where we try to explain the attrition depending on the monthly income plus the overtime. We use the family binomial and here we have, here we use the tidy. And as before, we get the estimate of the intercept. Here the intercept, since it's minus 0.33 and well, see, I, I'm not sure if that will make a lot of sense. Yes, it makes sense. You just don't look at the, this one as a kind of a, as it is. You just uh, using this one as a setup and then uh, just keep applying to the that formula. And then uh, actually this one is uh, not the negative value. This one is actually, when you say about the E negative 1.33, this one actually gives you about the very approximate value of the odd, what I can say. So actually this value, when you calculate the exponential of the this estimate, it is actually positive, not the negative. So, so that is actually kind of a kind of a trap. It is very easy to make a mistake. So yeah, just thinking about the this estimate as a kind of a kind of an exponential of the this, like a theta. So all of the this value actually stands for the this theta. And then uh, this one actually powered by our exponential, like a E value, cause the E value is a 2.74 or something, 741 or something. So it is always positive. And then this one is actually says about the, it's kind of a very small percentage like uh, almost close to the like uh, zero percentage to to get the get the kind of thing. So that means our initial status of the attrition is the zero, almost the zero. Likelihood is a kind of a zero. And then whenever we have an income and over time, it gonna be increases like this to one. Okay. Okay, got it. Uh, just to add to Cantu, uh, I posted uh, a statology uh, article 
uh, yeah. that you can check later about how to interpret those logistic regression coefficients. Mm -hmm. uh, just keep in mind that because you are applying a log, uh, the estimates, the coefficients that you are getting, uh, those are the exponents that you're going to apply to the E you know, uh, parameter to mm -hmm. get the odds ratio. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're yeah. getting a odds ratio. You're, you're not getting a linear, you know, uh, component here. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, if if you think that log as the you know the the function that you can then apply the the e the, the exponential the exponential function you know to get those uh, odds ratio, uh, they they are you know it's like the anti function right? You know, log is the anti function of exponential. Okay, so what we're dealing with that estimate is really the exponent of the uh, you know that that the log gives you, okay, and then you can apply it to the exponential, which is the e uh, function, to then get those odds odds ratio, which are better to inter interpret than you know the exponent itself. Yeah, just. Whenever you have uh, this kind of estimate and uh, you get the model, maybe if you really want to interpret the, what this one is about, you just uh, using the this this function like uh, exponential coef, and then yeah, I can I just uh, writing in the previous slide like this, and then whenever you learn this command, this one gonna give give you about uh, this exponential exponential result of the each variable, yeah, and then. And then you can feel free to thinking about uh, this one. Actually, uh, what I can say is uh, E negative 0 0.01. This one is actually kind of like a 1% decrease. That's what I what this one means usually. Because it maybe when you when you see about the one like a E point one, this one is actually approximate of 10% increase depending on about the, this power value okay i think that this one is a 1.1 i guess 1.1 is a 10 percent increase and then a, a negative not the point one negative point uh no 0 0.99 is the kind of a one percent decrease i think that's the kind of a little bit insight about this but anyway what is the clear about this one is uh, just using this one as a setup in your formula called this one yeah this and then uh, you just using all of the, these estimate as the setup setup value to apply to get the, this kind of odd ratio value so it is it seems like it is kind of a negative but the, the likelihood when you we try to do the exponential for the power, this is all actually represents about the somewhat of the positive likelihood going to zero, uh, transform our probability is zero to one. Okay, got it. Thank you. So in here. Now, we get the probability for attrition for those two models. As we can see here, it separates them in two lines, depending of if we have, if the worker has over time or it didn't have over time. And as we can see, the probability of attrition, it's almost always higher for a worker that has had over time over some worker that, well, it doesn't have over time. Now here, we, uh, we assess the model accuracy. We train the model here that we are getting. We are doing the cross validation here and we extract the sample performances. This is the accuracy. I understand that the accuracy is not always the best method to check for how good is a model but in here we can get that the model three here we have it the model three where we explain attrition with all the rest with all the other variables 
instead of just two or just the monthly income, it gives us a mean, an accuracy mean, a higher accuracy mean. The confusion mat matrix in here, let's see if we can see here. What the confusion matrix is trying to tell us, it's almost like what kind of error or model has the most. In here we have, if I'm not wrong, if I'm not mistaken, in here we have a type two error and in here we have a type one error. This is, uh, we predict it was going to be a yes, but it's actually a no. And we pre and here we predicted it is a no and when we it is actually a yes. It, this, this part, this confusion matrix, it is really important, I think, because depending on the problem, we need to check what kind of error are we most interested in. It is not the same having like if you're trying to model or if you're trying to predict like let's say a, a scam for a bank or if we're trying to predict here something for a nutrition for for let's say if we're trying to predict a scam it is very important that this type 2 error we try to minimize it because if we don't if we have a scam happening and if the, our model does not predict it, well, that's mm, that's worse than if no scam is happening and our model does predict it as it, it is happening. Here we have the accuracy of the model. As I was saying, uh, the accuracy is not always the best option to uh, evaluate a uh, model of a classification model. Here we have the kappa. I'm not sure what this kappa means. Um, I don't know if anyone can explain it. This one is actually kappa value is uh, kind of like a agreement kind of thing. So I'm not sure because it's uh, actually the kappa means in the, especially for the qualitative research, we actually say it's about the, if some, someone says something, maybe the other person also to say the same thing, like an agreement of the statement. So I think that this one is also same concept for this, but Ricardo, do you, do you have any idea about what this is? I, Hello. I, yeah, yes, I, I'm here. I, I'm I'm checking okay. the, the the formula, but uh, at the kappa as the F1 score, it uh, it considers because accuracy only considers the 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 true positives and the true negatives, right? Okay, mm -hmm. Be, uh, you know, divided you you add it up and you divide it by the total uh, observations. And you get that your accuracy. But the problem with the accuracy measure is that it doesn't consider the false uh, positives and false negatives. So the kappa and the F1 score, uh, in, uh, you know, include uh, those uh, measurements. You know, the, the recall and the precision uh, part of it. Let me check. Let me check the the formula, so I can post it there. Okay. Okay, got it. And yeah, because it's a uh, you know like, like uh, uh, Mateo said, uh, usually accuracy could be misleading, right? Especially for problems when we have uh, imbalance uh, classes. Okay, that uh, the the minority class is really way down. You know, you know, uh, compared to the majority, like a 90, 90, 10 per 90 percent and ten percent uh, case. And what happens is that the accuracy could be uh, good. But then, when you see the confusion matrix, you see that one of the one of the false uh, uh, parameters is not, you know, is 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 not being, uh, you know, uh, captured by the by, by the model. So then you use F one score, you use kappa to then try to uh, uh, optimize uh, that model 
trying to balance uh, those classes. That's one of the you know, scenarios. The other one here, uh, if you can go up, uh, Mateo. Okay. Uh, aha, in the, co the, the, the Confucian matrix. Uh, when we apply this to uh, business cases, for example, especially you know, in the, this case, when we, we have the churn, which is the turnover of, of employees, uh, we have to be aware that there are different costs for the missing predictions, okay? Uh, the cost of predicting that an employee is going to turn, is going to churn, is going to go away, is, is going to uh, quit or resign. Uh, and then the actual you know, uh, situation of your serve value is that he's not going to do that. It's totally different. The cost in the company is totally different for when we predict that the employee is not going to leave, but then he leaves, okay? Because the cost of leaving uh, for that company is way higher than the the the, the employee staying, right? Okay, you know the the disruption, the recruiting of a new resource, the training of the new resource, uh, the learning curve that that employee. A yeah, new employee is going to be, you know, having is way more costly than the the employee uh, staying, right? So because of that, we have to then try to optimize the model. And one of the things that we can do is, for example, in the GLM function, the threshold to, you know, score if the if the if the prediction is going to be a zero or a one. Uh, the, 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 the default threshold is 0 0.5, okay? You know, that, that's, the, that, that's, the, that, that's the margin where we decide, the model decide if it's going to be a one or it's going to be a zero because this is based on probabilities, right? So what happens is that you can change that threshold, okay? To try to maximize those measurements, the metrics, the kappa and the F1 score, which you know, capture those false uh, positives and false negatives to try to minimize the cost of people uh, leaving, but the model not capturing. Okay, so uh, we can do that, but in the in the usually in the research area, in the academic area, uh, we are very comfortable, right, with that threshold, uh, zero point five, because it's the balance, right, the balance between the models. And then we can say, okay, we can max, uh, minimize type one, uh, you know, leave type two uh, 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 alone. But in the business case, it's kind of, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to check those costs, okay? Associated with missing those predictions because the cost could be very different, okay? And then uh, it, will, it will give you a point of reference to try to then maximize the output, not of the accuracy, but the, the total output in the confusion matrix. All right? Well, yes, that is indeed very important because as I was saying, not every case is the same for this type of classification methods. And you have to always like look at the, look at the situation you're in to see if you prefer a model that minimizes the type two or minimizes the type one. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, perfect. So in here, well, I uh, as we did see the kappa is also very important. I did knew that the kappa, it is a very important a value to keep in mind, but I really didn't knew what it meant. In here, we have the sensitivity and the specificity. In this case, uh, the author tells us that we do well predicting cases of non-attrition. Uh, this is seen by the highest specificity, but our model is poor predicting actual cases of attrition and that is the sensitivity. That I think it is always is also given by the imbalance of the, that's an imbalance of the classes on, on our data set. 
I don't know if you want to uh, add something else here. It looks uh, like yeah, it's a kind of a adjusted, adjusted accuracy value based on some of the force, uh, force cases, I guess. Uh, yes, I, I just want to add that for imbalance cases, there are uh, you know methods uh, to try to balance you know that imbalance in the in the predictive uh, class. Uh, for example, in the there's a library called uh, I think it's called Themis, okay, which is the it it, it is the in in the justice you know when when you uh, study law or or you know uh, criminal justice. Uh, you see this figure of a lady with a balance, with a scale, right? Okay, that, that, that's Themis, that's the goddess of, uh, you know, of justice. So uh, that library uh, gives you uh, tools uh, to uh, downsampling, uh, upsampling uh, the, uh, you know, the, the majority or the minority class in this case. And that, that helps the model, that helps the model to uh, capture that minority. Uh, class, because usually these models tend to, you know, be biased by the majority, not the minority. Okay, so uh, that that's something that with practice, you know, with the practice, you know, you get more uh, proficient. Okay, thank you. And as Kentao is putting here the balance accuracy, it is the sensitivity activity plus the specificity over two. Okay, so let's continue here. Now for the uh, rock curve, in here that is how we calculate it. We are calculating for the model one where we only had one explanatory variable and for the model three, where we explain with all variables. Oh, here it doesn't show. Oh, it's not showing here. Okay, in here we have the rock curve. So what it is the rock curve is that we plot the true positive rate against the false positive rate. And what we want is that this curve is more open to the left. So if we have a curve of 45 degrees, that means a linear curve over that goes from this point from zero to zero from here it is the model is not it is it is not better than guessing that's what i understand and the more the curve goes to the left it, the better is the model that's what i understand about the rock curve but um, i don't know a lot about that one and i couldn't like investigate i don't know if anyone wants to add something here actually what you just say is just kind of a very basic yeah it's a crack because uh, what the rsd club is about is so uh, uh what's the what's the force tip force positive rate depending on the two positive so that means how how accurate the model gonna be predicts about the two positive and then when we get the debt to positive ratio here, and then uh, what's the probability of the model going to be predicted in a wrong way? You know, that's the, how this one is about, but we don't use, in, we don't interpret that kind of way. We just using, like you, you, like you just said, is just after drawing the 45 degree, which is the very poor, perfectly poor prediction. And then, uh, as you can say, whenever we get the curve like uh, like more more skewed more skewed to the uh, to the right, like uh, have a more 
kind of a steep curve line in the first line. This one gonna be much better result for the for the our our prediction. So it is uh yeah you are saying is a uh, yeah very accurate because uh it is just uh, literally about the how strong how predictive our model is depending on the this graph gonna be going to the uh, top left. Got it. So in this case, we always want that curve. It goes to the top left. So let's see here. Let's continue. Uh, before the features, I just wanted to add that in the book, it says that the residuals and everything, it, it doesn't show really how to do a residual analysis on generalized linear model in this case from a logistic regression. I wanted to mention that we can do some things here. Let me see. If we want to check for independence, we do residuals versus the lag residuals. This is for independence of the variable, of the observation, sorry. And we are looking here. What we want is that it does not follow any pattern, any kind of, any kind of, that's how I say it, I say it pattern. Um, I'm not really sure. If we want to check if the if we are using the correct link function, as I was saying, not always we not always we need to use the canonical link function for the binomial regression. We can use another link function other than the logit and the other than the logit. We we do the residuals versus the fitted versus fitted values. As in here, we also don't want to follow any kind of pattern. And if it doesn't, if it goes something like this or like, like this, or something like this. What we want to do is uh, maybe we want to transform the explanatory variables, or maybe we want to change the link function. Uh, what also what we can check is the variance. We want the variance to be constant here. If it follows a pattern here or here, uh, we want to change the family. If this is not constant, what we are looking for is to change the family. Maybe we can, well, for, for the yes or no values, yeah, maybe we can do a Bernoulli regression, may, uh, but if our variance is like that, it is not constant, we want to change that family. So it is very important to do this residual analysis. It does, in the book, it doesn't show mostly for generalized linear models. I don't, uh, for logistic regression, it is one type of generalized linear model. But yes, it is very important to do this residual analysis and I didn't see it in the book. Now, I don't know how to erased all this. Uh, you know, Mateo, I think maybe this book doesn't the like, most attention that I see was how they expect we use cross-validation to validate our models. Because residuals are important and you are going to use a, let me see the traditional way of using statistics. Oh, okay. So, if, for example, even though you don't see that part, then 
Maybe there is a could help you to understand which model is the best, you say. But the approach of this book is cross-validation to say, oh, this model is better to this because you have a lower error rate uh, after making cross-validation. Okay, okay. Here. So just for the last part here, we had our features that we can, as we did with linear models, we can check the importance of each feature. Here we have the 20 features with the most importance. And one part that I didn't show here. Okay, let's see. Open the book here. Uh, yes. Just, just, just adding about the the residuals analysis in this type of model, the logistic regression. Uh, the author uh, uh, points out that although it's not common uh, to do this in this type of model, uh, residual analysis and diagnostics are equally important to GLM mod, GLMs, right? General and realized. The problem is that there is no obvious way to define what a residual is for more general models, okay? Because in the linear regression, we know exactly what the residual is, right? Which is the distance between the observed value and the, you know, the corresponding value in the, in the linear regression uh, model, right? The prediction. So we have a clear uh, measurement of the of the residuals. Uh, here it gets a little bit tricky, right? Because what is the yes. the author the author asks, for example, how can you we really define a residual in logistic regression when the outcome is either zero or one? Okay. So he says that there are some you know uh, methodologies. For example, Harrell, uh, he says that Harrell has the pseudo uh, residuals. Okay which I'm just you know, assuming that is you know, something like the linear regression or what applied to a, a logistic regression in this case, okay? Maybe on the probability side. And there's also uh, another paper that says that there's a concept of surrogate uh, residuals. I know that in the summary, you have deviance residuals, okay? The only thing is that I don't know right now if the assumptions of the linear regression for the residuals are the same for those deviance residuals in the logistic regression. I, I, I don't know that, that you know, how to answer that, one, okay? So maybe that's why the author you know, doesn't go deep into uh, this topic. It, you know, let, let's the reader, let the reader find out, uh, okay, these are the methods that I have researched so far, you know, go and find out, okay? Okay, yes. In this case, one that I knew, know about is mm -hmm. that I know about the deviance for every generalized linear model, for every right. exponential family, there is deviance, there is per Pearson residuals, uh, there All is right. Anscombe residuals, everything, not so much in, in books. I don't find that theory in books, but mm -hmm. that is very well, like. Yeah, Ma uh, Ma Mateo, my, my question is, yeah, you're, you're right. You know, there are all kinds of residuals for these models. The, the thing is that, do we apply the same assumptions for the residuals for the linear regression to those deviance residuals, for example, for the logistic regression, in other words, that they have to be a random, that they have to have a uniform variance and things like that. Do we, you know, uh, adopt that or not? That that is really my question here, and it's something that uh, we have to find out more information about that. Okay. Oh, also, okay. because the the author mentions these other methods, maybe these other methods are more akin to the logistic regression model than importing some assumptions from the linear regression, okay? 
So, uh, you know, it's, it's a topic that we have to, you know, kind of uh, research a little bit more, you know, to understand what is really a residual in logistic regression, really, uh, and what does it mean, okay? okay. I mean, that, that's, my, that's my personal, you know, take here. You know, maybe you, you have something, you know, different. <laughs> oh, no, in this case, I do know that that theory exists. Okay. That we can do the same as for linear models, for generalized linear models, uh, speaking about residuals, but I'm not that familiar. I couldn't answer you right now, to be honest. Actually, I just shared uh, some figure on the chatting and then when you say about the, this, when you think, when we talking about the residual for the logistic regression, it look like uh, this. And then uh, it's actually, here is the zero value. Mm -hmm. It look like this, you know? <laughs> so that means it is uh, maybe in under the kind of a linear regression, linear regression assumptions, it is very hard to tell does this residual is a random or not, okay? Because uh, according to the generalized linear regression, basic one of the basic assumption is our residual, like uh, error term, should be the random, like uh, like mm -hmm. this, right? Correct. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Like this, but like like uh, like you said, Mateo, maybe if we have uh, this kind of a pattern, like uh, this kind of pan out pattern, this is actually heterogeneity kind of a problem. So then in that case, we have to think about a different way about the modeling. But the thing is in the logistic regression, our, when we try to plot the residual, it looks like this, <laughs> like, a, like a zero to one or negative one, this kind of case, okay? Mm -hmm. So in this case, it is very hard to say about the, because this is a kind of a random or, or it has a kind of a problem kind of thing. So that's the reason why we actually do not um uh, know about the it's a kind of a randomly residual kind of a have having the logistic regression or not so we actually don't use the, these kind of things mm -hmm. in the logistic regressions so that's the reason why of course especially for the, our predictive purposes in the logistic regression we actually using the cross validation method not the this kind of a residual to get the fitted value because our residual, whenever you actually drawing the your logistic regression residual, it looked like this. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let me draw again here. Like uh, here is a zero, and then uh, there is a uh, all different kind of a uh, zero value like a line here, and then there is another zero value, a uh, one value along the line shows about the probability changes. So these kind of a deviance actually clearly kind of a pattern has a pattern, but the thing is that this, this one is a, we do not sure about that this is a kind of a random or not. So because of that, we don't use the, these kind of a residual approaches, actually deviance. So yeah, so I think that's what I understand about this because uh, whenever we draw the, this kind of a residual line for the logistic regression, it is always about the zero to one kind of a probability problem. So then in that case, we actually getting the these kind of a very very not non random lines non random not non random kind of a deviance of the residual. So it is very hard to say about the it does this kind of a has a problem about the residual assumption or good kind of things. Actually, look in the logistic regression is a kind of like a violate of the this kind of a linear regression assumption because it is not the random because it's about the zero to one kind of problem. Oh, yes. <laughs> what you are saying is, sir, that is, that is for this logistic regression, the residuals, it does have that form. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, I think I'm leading the discussion more to all the generalized linear models. I should be leading more of the discussion for the logistic model that we are trying. But if we do the Pearson residuals for this one, for the logistic mm -hmm. regression versus, now those are like a standardized. So it will actually mm -hmm. follow, I think, I think from what I remember, the Pearson residuals 
even for this logistic regression, it does follow like the norm for the linear models one. Um, I not 100% sure, but I think I remember that. Yeah, I also cannot answer that one either because it is, because as far as I know is a logistic regression is a kind of like a, those kind of a residual pattern gonna be show up. And then I just share the link about the deviance residual for the logistic regression. And then I hope that we can check this out. And then I hope that this one gonna be explained about the more about the, this residual kind of problem. So, yeah. So okay, good. Yeah, I, I also posted in the chat, the, you know, an article by uh, the University of Virginia, okay, mm -hmm. about the pseudo residuals uh that that is a reference in in the book okay mm, mm. okay and, and it's a it's it's kind of a long explanation so mm. <laughs> yeah you have, to, you have to be in a good mood here <laughs> <laughs> to, to, de to delve into that <laughs> yeah right <laughs> okay got it but yeah. just as a final thoughts on this one it is like for linear models, for the ones that we were saying before, logistic regression suffers from many assumptions. Like, let's say, the linear relationship, the multicollinearity, some other assumptions that outliers, correct link function, uh, correct variance, all of that. And we can select other models that we were that we will see later that doesn't suffer as, as much as this one this is like the base from uh, to get to those ones i don't know if anyone wants to add anything else yes because uh, like we said because uh, that is also one of the reason why the residual for the logistic regression is a kind of like a, a little bit doubtful to use because of the this kind of a multicollinearity or linear relationship problem. So logistic regression actually have uh, this violates sometimes frequently violates about this kind of problem. And then uh, in this case, in the logistic regression, we cannot actually fully sure about the how much multicollinearity actually have in the logistic regression model, or how much linear relationship, like how much randomized, randomized the residual we can get. And then what's the criteria or threshold for that? We don't know actually in the logistic regression. So that's the things I, it mentions in here. Yeah, this one is a very important point, I guess. Because uh, actually, I think that I'm not sure it is possible for us to estimate about the VIF factor for the logistic regressions to testing the multicollinearity. I don't think there is a function for the testing the multicollinearity in logistic regression. Do you have any idea for that? Because uh, I don't, as far as I know, I haven't used the testing the multicollinearity problem in the logistic regressions, but maybe there might be some function that allows us to testing the multicollinearity in the logistic regression. But in, in the Gaussian or some kind of a simple linear generalized linear regression, we actually use in the BIF factor, like a variance, uh, 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 variance factor, uh, inflation, yeah, inflation factor, yeah, yeah, factor. We mm -hmm. can calculate this one to testing the multicollinearity. But in case of the logistic regression model, I don't know if if there is any function in R that allows us to testing the this multicollinearity among the among the variable we use. So that's my question, but. But anyway, at, at the at the at the end of the, this paragraph, it also also clearly mentioned about that there is a more 
uh, additional algorithm that allows us to give us a more trustworthy classification approaches for, for these kind of problem other than the logistic regression. So like uh, you said, Mateo, you actually logistic regression is a kind of like a baseline modeling approaches to for the classification problem in the machine learning. So yeah, maybe we can learn about those things later. Yeah, random forest or decision tree or K nearest neighbor or even neighbors or even single vector machine model, right? Uh, like a support vector machine. So yeah, we can learn about those things later, so. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, okay, so 